pick up where we left off in our last segment. We were talking about the dream of the Red Chamber, which is a uh, classic novel of uh, Chinese, a major part of the Chinese literary canon written by Chao Zhu King, who was the grandson of the curator of this project undertaken by the King Dynasty to catalog, translate, and uh, save the poems of the Tang Dynasty. Now this, uh, this group of poems, and there are literally hundreds of poems in this repository of poetry from the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it was a sort of a, uh, library uh, restoration uh, project that took place and it was a way of conveying respect for the larger Chinese culture by the rulers, the Manchu rulers of, of the Qing Dynasty and another way of unifying the country and bringing the country together through myth, legend and through cultural heritage. And it was a very effective project um, and we'll mention another one of those projects a little later, uh, this novel, The Dream of the Red Chamber, which is also uh, referred to as the story of the stone, uh, became uh, a legendary piece, which is still um, the source of inspiration for films and even a uh, 2010 uh, television show in China. Uh, television series in China and we're going to see this over and over again contemporary films uh, not just in China but in Japan and we've seen it in India as well drawing on ancient traditions as inspiration and we have the same thing in the United States as well to a certain extent although we tend toward uh, more contemporary storytelling lots of times in our in our television series as zombies and whatever uh, so I'm going to move now to discuss this innovation of Chinese opera. It really began as a series of regional operas all over the country. Uh, there are thought to be between 100 and almost maybe 400 uh, different uh, regional operas uh, containing different dialects and music that have some similarities and in, in stylistic uh, form similarities and they coalesced here in the Qing Dynasty in something that we call the Peking Opera which might seem like a sort of an antiquated title it's often referred to as Beijing Opera or Capital Opera but historians still refer to it as Peking Opera and it is really the national theatrical style of China um, in many ways. We're going to go into a great deal of depth in the next module, so I'm not going to go into it too much at this point, but it is uh, interesting to look at the historical underpinnings of this in the Qing Dynasty. So we see that as this dynasty flourished, uh, Many regional centers began to pop up, particularly in the Yellow River Basin. New cities were formed. As I mentioned, uh, more arable land came into production. Uh, the population grew. The population prospered economically. And a lot of the hardships that were suffered among the people during the Ming period uh, had been alleviated. And there was a flourishing of culture under uh, less warfare, better uh, more uh, uh, equitable regional government. And so a lot of little cultural activities began to spring up in these new cities and, and the operas were a big part of that. And unlike a lot of the theatrical movements in the United States, which tended to begin in New York or the major cities and then spread outward into the uh, regional centers, regional theater, often is a sort of a, a reproduction of the theater that you would see in New York. This was a trend that was completely the other way around. The regional operas uh, sprung up all over and there became two main regional centers of opera, uh, one being Beijing and the other being uh, Yangshao, but 
they had each had their own sort of particular uh, styles and regionalisms and only in Pekin opera did we start to see a synthesis of the ancient and the modern coming together to form this new and exciting uh, form of drama. Now, uh, these were also uh, important because it was a, a fusion of the kinds of theater that you would see more in the north and in the south, which is sort of distinctive in China. Uh, again, that had uh, an enormous unifying effect on the nation as well. So as these regional operas were brought to the capital and shown, uh, little pieces of them were incorporated into Peking opera, and then there was a flow the other way out as troops began to go back out into uh, the regions with this new form of opera. Uh, the the uh, operas themselves reflected and echoed time when agrarian culture was at its peak, uh, people were prosperous, and people lived in peace. So they tended to have very heroic stories, um, uplifting stories, etc. And this is one of the things that empowered this, this style throughout uh, very tragic and traumatic periods of Chinese history that followed uh, the end of the Qing Dynasty into the period of the Republic and then ultimately into the time of um, Communist China. So we'll go into some detail on that as time goes on, but uh, it's a wonderfully uh, specific and culturally iconic form and something that we're going to spend a lot of time on.